As I'm sure anyone who has subscribed to me knows by now, licensed cartoon games were kind of my thing growing up. That being said, I wouldn't have necessarily considered myself a big Rugrats fan back in those days. I watched the show, sure, but at that point, all I could truly think about was Spongebob. I already had all of the big Spongebob games back in those very early 2000s though. Battle for Bikini Bottom wasn't being advertised yet, or at least, I hadn't seen anything about it. And I had easily played my fill, and then some, of Revenge of the Flying Dutchman and Super Sponge. So when my birthday came around in 2003, my parents' decision on what to get me was likely a bit more tricky. To make it easier on everyone, my mother simply took me with her to a GameStop at the local mall to pick something out myself. She had already seen a cheap PS1 game based on Bob the Builder that she thought I might like. I was very young back then. But it was only a few bucks, and she wanted me to choose something else to go along with it. I browsed the shelves of PS2 games, almost deciding on a Tom and Jerry game, because I didn't see much else that interested me. But then I stumbled upon a picture of Tommy Pickles riding a magic carpet, and Rugrats sounded more fun to me than the more old school cartoon. We got the game, I took it home, and as I started to play, it quickly became one of my all-time favorites. Little did I know that one day, I would live just a few miles away from the place where it was created. Salt Lake City, Utah. If you didn't already know, this Rugrats platformer was developed by Avalanche Software. If you've played any number of Disney or Nickelodeon games in the last couple of decades, you've probably seen their logo scroll across your screen at least once. Their origins go far deeper than cartoon platformers though. When you take a step back and look at the bigger picture, you could say that Avalanche began with a studio known as Sculptured Software. This little company was founded by a trio of aspiring game developers in 1984. George Midos, Brian Brandenburg, and Peter Adams. Located in Salt Lake City, they became officially incorporated in 1985, with the help of two interested investors, Mike McCreese and Robert Burgener. According to George Midos, the early days of this company were difficult, and their early games left much to be desired. But hey, what else is new? According to a 1996 interview conducted by Roger Pusey of Deseret News, Midos said, the early years with Sculptured Software were tough ones because the company didn't have a definite goal and didn't make money for six years. I didn't receive a salary for two years. It seems quite common for startups like Sculptured to struggle out of the gate, and there are likely many more companies like this one that no one will ever hear about because they failed to weather the storm. After several video game failures, the company finally reached a point where its products were decent, said Midos. Initially, the company had the wrong kind of clients the wrong kind of video game format, and bad talent. We had to hire 500 programmers to get the 60 we still have today. George Mitos, 1996. To hear former employees at Sculpture tell it, their first big breakout hit was Jack Nicklaus Golf, and as technology improved, they quickly became a top developer for the Super Nintendo. By 1991, they were simultaneously developing Tecmo Super NBA Basketball, the notoriously difficult first entry in the Super Star Wars series, and perhaps most notably, the SNES version of Mortal Kombat. Though this particular release wasn't without its issues. According to John Blackburn, once junior programmer on Mortal Kombat, in a 2010 interview with Jeff Cork of Game Informer, At the end of the project, the programmer who programmed the Super Nintendo version of that didn't essentially port the code. He didn't copy the code, he re-engineered the whole game. So when it went out to market, the timings were a little bit off, so none of the combos worked. When he started doing the game, nobody realized this. But by the time it came out, there was a way to play it in the arcades that you wanted to play on the home systems. John Blackburn, 2010. This programmer was apparently only a contractor, and was gone before they could do anything to rectify this situation. Blackburn was given the role to fix the mess by publisher and longtime sculptured software partner, Acclaim, so that they could release a subsequent entry in the franchise. Mortal Kombat Nitro, which he did. But when it came down to it, Nitro was cancelled in favor of releasing a full-on sequel, Mortal Kombat 2. Regardless of a few bumps in the road, Sculpture's pedigree was clear to all who knew them at that point, and Acclaim decided they didn't want them to slip away, and leadership at the company was glad to have a steady flow of funds that a buyout would bring. Thus, on October 9th, 1995, Acclaim purchased Sculptured Software for a value of $30 million in stock. By that point though, all of the other founders but George Midos had left the company, 
Sculptured became Iguana West, named after another gaming developer that Acclaim had recently acquired. And one would think the future looked bright, but at the exact same time as this buyout, a large group of Sculptured's employees left. With four of Sculptured's lead programmers steering the boat, a new development studio was formed in Salt Lake, with several other artists and programmers. They dubbed themselves Avalanche Software. Spearheading this group of four was that one-time junior programmer, John Blackburn. The other three founders have been difficult for me to determine, as the names don't seem to have been documented like they should have been. Based on their work history and some other factors though, I believe I've narrowed it down to it being either James Henn, Joe Barnes, Todd Blackburn, David Ross, Ned Martin, or perhaps Marcus Fisher. Obviously that's more names than three, but they were all at one time important members of Sculptured that went on to work at the newly formed Avalanche. It isn't entirely clear to me why the group felt the need to split as Sculptured was being bought, but one interview conducted by Gavin Sheehan on CityWeekly.net paints a bit of a clearer picture. The year that Sculptured was acquired by Acclaim was interesting. We knew the owner was shopping Sculptured to be sold, but we thought we were going to be sold to EA because there were a lot of rumors in the company. Myself and the guy I went to lunch with every day started to talk of one of our friends who had left the previous year to go to Sapphire in Utah County. Sapphire needed programmers for a game they were going to take from Mindscape. We were interested but did not want to commute to Pleasant Grove. The owner of Sapphire convinced us to start our own company so that he could subcontract the programming to us. We would open our own office in Salt Lake and that way we wouldn't have to commute. It wasn't really our idea to start a company, but it fit the needs of the situation at the time. John Blackburn, 2011. George Midos left the company himself after only a year, leaving his old creation to become nothing but a shadow of its former self. Iguana West was later renamed to Acclaim Studio Salt Lake City in 1999, but then just a few years later in 2002, the branch was dissolved as a cost-cutting measure. Avalanche, however, went on to thrive in their new situation, and clearly made the right call to leave when they did. After we'd been in business three weeks, the sculptured acquisition by Acclaim was announced. They also announced the acquisition of a British developer named Probe. This created an interesting situation where Midway had nobody to make their Mortal Kombat games because Acclaim had just bought both companies that had experience. One of the founders of Avalanche had a brother who worked at Midway. When Midway found out that we had already started our own company, they offered us the ultimate Mortal Kombat titles on the spot. We actually lucked into working on some of the best-selling games of the year. We could not have planned a more advantageous circumstance. It set us up with a great relationship with Midway. We worked almost exclusively for Midway for the next five years. John Blackburn, 2011. This relationship with Midway and their formation of a solid reputation is what seems to have earned them the ability to eventually work with THQ and Nickelodeon. We started working with other companies as executives from Midway left and went to other publishers. We were never all that good at business development, but we did have a rock solid reputation with the people we had worked with. And as people moved around, they wanted to continue to use us in their new companies. The VP of production left Midway and went to work for THQ. He offered us the Rugrats games, which were selling a ton at the time. We were always interested in big sellers because of the royalties that they generated. It was the first kids game that we had made that marked a transition for us. John Blackburn, 2011. This transition to making kids games would go on to be quite possibly the most important shift they ever made, as it would seemingly be the only thing they ever made again, with a few exceptions. Now that we know a brief history of how the company began, and how they came to make licensed children's games, let's turn our attention to Rugrats Royal Ransom itself, and see what it's all about. When you boot up the game, one thing always jumps out at me immediately. The copyright page mentions Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. Why, you might ask? We'll come back to that in just a second. This game was developed somewhere around the 2000 to 2001 range, and the graphics clearly exemplify that. Since I grew up on this graphical style though, I can't lie, I find it incredibly charming. After the title screen we find ourselves on a basic menu with three options, play adventure, play silly stuff, and special features. Of course, I have to check special features first, right? Ah, this explains that copyright page before the opening logos. Revenge of the Flying Dutchman and this game were being made and released right around the same time, so it would make sense that they would advertise a game about Nickelodeon's most popular cartoon ever wherever they could. It's a bit weird though that Special Features is just the one trailer, at least in the GameCube version. Oh well, I guess let's see what Play Silly Stuff means. Huh. See, they don't exactly explain what this is. 
and it took a kid like me a good chunk of time playing the main game to actually figure this out. But once again, we'll come back to this later. I guess the only thing to do from here is to play the main adventure. There are three options for difficulty, which are actually pretty significant leaps for a kid's game. Baby Easy feels like you barely have to try, while Reptar Tough genuinely makes me want to pull my hair out. For the sake of not wanting to torture myself, I'll go with Rugrat Medium when recording most of the footage. Our story begins with Tommy Pickle's father, Stu, showing off his brand new invention to Tommy's grandpa, the Play Palace 3000. Looking at it at first, nobody thinks it's all that great, but according to Stu, this is just what it looks like when it's turned off. After a few button presses, the dinky little castle launches into the air, and beneath it springs up one of the coolest McDonald's play areas you will ever see. Yeah, remember when we had play areas before the world imploded? That was nice. For children, I mean. Typically a 24 year old man playing on one is frowned upon, unfortunately. The babies are all obviously amazed, while longtime baby antagonist Angelica is not impressed. That is, until Grandpa Lou comments about how the tower on the top looks fit for a queen. In typical Angelica fashion, she believes she must be that queen, and sneaks away as Stu asks Grandpa to watch the children, while he goes to buy more parts to finish up the play palace. In his typical fashion, Grandpa Lou proceeds to pass out immediately, with his eyes open. They look open, right? Am I crazy? The babies huddle around, and discuss plans to play on this marvelous new invention, but unfortunately, they are in for a rude awakening. Angelica has already laid claim to the Play Palace, and as the new self-proclaimed Queen of the Backyard, she insists that the babies are now her loyal suspects, and have to do whatever she says. Tommy doesn't like the sound of this game though, and refuses his older cousin. The new Queen was prepared for this outcome, however, and reveals that she has stolen all of the baby's most precious items. Tommy's Lion, Chucky's Wawa, Kimmy's Super Thing, and the Twins' Worms. Since the babies don't want to be her suspects, Angelica claims she will use the baby's toys instead. With newfound resolve, Tommy rallies the others, and they make plans to overthrow Angelica, and take back their toys, as well as the Play Palace. Once we are thrown into the game's hub world, we are greeted with a decision. We can switch between each baby with the press of a button. None of them have any special abilities or other advantages over another, so this is mainly a choice of preference. It also helps you to not go incredibly insane when the voice clips of one baby play over and over and over and you need to switch things up. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. To get onto the play palace, you need coins. 100 per baby to be exact. You can explore the house and the yard to collect a few if you feel the need to, but there aren't enough here to get you access. I'm not really sure why they chose to put a handful of coins in this opening area, but I can only assume they wanted to give you some small incentive to explore. Personally though, pushing this plan around like a maniac is all the incentive I need. Luckily, the game starts you out with 500 coins, so you can get on immediately. But why play the actual levels when you can just push this plan around? When you're finally on the play palace, you'll find two little environments. A snow area and a jungle area, each with three levels. There's also this extremely dangerous vacuum tube that stretches the babies like a ball of dough into a shop area, but we aren't able to purchase anything here just yet. To enter a level, you need little batteries. You'll start out with a few you can find on the playset, and then you'll find more throughout each level itself. So while you complete each major goal, you'll have to venture off the path a little to get some more of these as well. The game won't tell you exactly what you'll be doing in a level before you open it with the batteries, but they each have titles that will give you a hint to the theme of the main task, such as Mr. Snowtato Head or Punting Papayas. While Susie doesn't make a physical appearance in the main campaign, she does serve as the narrator and tutorial giver throughout the adventure. She will pop in at the start of every level to give you instructions, and then at the end to congratulate or sympathize with you, depending on if you succeed or fail. If for some reason you miss the initial instructions, you can replay them on the pause menu with Susie's Rules. Angelica also chimes in as a disembodied voice to ridicule and demean you, like a good cousin always does. Yeah. Are you serious? I gotta carry the whole thing! He's a I gotta carry this whole stupid thing! <laughs> You're terrible. I'm banning you from my Fortnite friendship. You know, I'm never gonna play Fortnite with either of you again. So you need little batteries to enter these levels, but what is the goal of the levels once you're in one? 
Well, if you complete the given task in each of them, you'll get a big battery. These big batteries will provide the play palace with more power, and once you've filled up an entire slot, the structure will grow taller and new areas will appear. This is where some of the difference in difficulty selection comes in. In the easy and medium difficulties, you only need to do a handful of these challenges to complete the battery slot in advance. However, if you chose Reptar Tough, you'll have to complete nearly every single one. And some of them really, really suck. It all starts out simple enough. While you can choose to begin with any one of these six doors, I always prefer to jump into the snowy section. In Mr. Snowtato Head, you have to explore and collect different parts of a snowman in order to rebuild him after a sledding accident. In Snow Place to Hide, the friendly snowman becomes an evil army of snowman enemies, and you have to snowball fight your way to the top of the mountain to get a key to unlock a treasure chest. And then, in Ready Set Snow, you sled race a pair of snowman brothers to the bottom of a mountain. I should also mention that in most levels, you'll have to avoid these Angelica jack-in-the-boxes that explode when you touch them, and in the harder difficulties, you'll find a lot more of them. These levels are some of the most enjoyable to me, because they are the most simple, and since they're right at the beginning, I've probably also played them the most over the years. Throughout these first few levels, as well as later into the game, exploration is key. You'll find shortcuts, both intended and unintended as well as some interesting easter eggs. Hi, Tack. And of course, lots of little batteries that are vital to progress forward. The problem with this focus on exploration is that from the jungle area forward, not all of these environments are so simple to traverse. They get bigger, and at times more confusing. And while you have a radar of sorts to somewhat guide you, it doesn't always help. Luckily, in easy and medium difficulty, you have a little extra help in every world in the form of the Magic Helper Ball. This is a floating orb that will lead you forward towards your objective, if you simply touch it. In some instances, it's a very welcome feature. In fact, in some later levels, it's practically a requirement to use this ball. One example is in the Circus Big Top, where you need to touch the ball in order to get more seconds added to the time limit. In some of the bigger, more confusing areas, the ball is pretty vital to help you stay on the path. In levels like these, the helper ball will also appear in the Reptar Tough difficulty, but only when absolutely necessary. In the jungle section, we find three more doors to new areas, and here is where Reptar Tough starts to take its toll. In monkey business, you have to hit the monkeys with bananas to stun them, and then pick them up and bring them to cages. As I say that out loud though, I realize what a messed up and inhumane concept that is for a children's game. I mean, how would you feel if you were minding your own business, just hanging out in your yard, and Tommy Pickles or Chucky Finster showed up out of nowhere, pelted you with sandwiches until you passed out, and then you woke up in prison? These poor freaking monkeys. Oh well, I kinda hate them anyway. They are so freaking impossible to hit with these stupid bananas, and they never slow down. I'd say you could just spam the whole time, and just hope, but no. You can't really do that, because unlike the snowballs, you have a limited number of nanners. Thankfully, you can find more, but the pickups for them are few and far between, especially in Reptar Tough. So basically, this whole level is getting lost, trying to find monkeys with a radar that barely helps, then making a perfectly timed shot to hit them. Then you have to find a cage to put them in, and some of these cages require parkour harder than anything you'll ever find on a Minecraft server, and if you fail to make one of these jumps, you drop the monkey, and have to go find it all over again. I hate it, I hate this level, it sucks, moving on. Punting papayas isn't much better, but it's at least not as easy to get lost. The goal is to collect papayas from a tree, then take that papaya to a shipping crate, then collect another from the next tree, which then functions as a checkpoint. It's a little more straightforward than the monkeys, but you still have to do some pretty ridiculous platforming along the way. Luckily, the checkpoints ease some of that tension, but they don't always work quite right. I've experienced instances where it didn't trigger at all when I fell, and also times when I get taken back when I didn't need to be. Luckily, these moments aren't incredibly common, so it isn't exactly game-breaking. While we're on the topic though, here's another tangent about something that annoys me in this game. The falling. Falling from a large height while platforming is fine. It makes sense, and isn't intrusive in the least. However, this game doesn't like falling of any kind. 
slip off a small rock or other little ledge, fall on your butt and take damage. Double jump a little too far on a downhill incline, fall on your butt and take damage. Over and over and over. This in and of itself would be an inconvenience for sure, since you take damage every single time. But what makes it astronomically worse is that every time it happens, the character sits there for like a solid 3 or 4 seconds before standing back up. That might not sound like a lot, but when you can't move or do anything in those seconds, it feels like an eternity. Especially when the fall turns into a slide that you can't do anything about in the slightest, and then you fall into something that will damage you. In my opinion, platformers feel best when there's fluidity of movement that doesn't slow down when you jump off of every little bump in the terrain. Mario and Sonic have moments like these in their games, but they make more sense. Mario has to fall off of a pretty massive cliff before he ends up stuck in the ground for a few seconds. Sonic slows down when you don't dodge the massive freaking spikes or other obstacles, but that's just the general part of the gameplay loop. In this game, Oops, I drop a couple feet, baby fall down, go boom. It doesn't make the game unplayable, and it's not as common as I may have made it just sound, but it's one of the biggest annoyances I have with this game. Maybe their mindset was that these are babies, and naturally, in the real world, babies fall on their butt like this if they take one wrong step. That makes sense in the real world, but this is a 3D platformer. I think we can be a little more forgiving. Luckily, there are plenty of this game's health pickups, band-aids strewn throughout each area, so you can usually heal up pretty quick. But I can recall more than a couple of occasions where I lost all of my progress in a level after an hour or more because I lost a life falling over and over and over without being able to find a band-aid. Anyways, moving on to the third jungle level, River Fun Run. This one sucks. Frankly, I don't know how they thought anyone of any age could beat this one, because I don't think I ever have even to this day. This one is a race against crocodiles on a riverboat. Racing is already hard enough on its own, because the controls in this one are jank. But it doesn't help that there are a ton of obstacles and angelica boxes in the harder difficulties. And I usually end up dying before I can even get close to winning the second and third lap. Maybe other people are better at this one, I don't know. I just know, I hate it. After all that complaining, I need a plant break. Once you collect enough big batteries on this floor, Tier 2 playset transformation will commence. In this new section of the Play Palace, we have the choice to explore a circus area, a desert area, and an underwater area that you get to through another vacuum tube, because Tommy's dad has lost his actual mind. Please call Child Protective Services immediately. I suppose he did also build giant kaiju robots that the babies used to rampage through Paris fighting an evil Frenchman, so maybe a sucky tube isn't all that bad. I always prefer to start in the circus levels because they're my favorite on this floor. Cone Caper is somewhat similar to Snow Place to Hide, but this time you're throwing snow cones at these evil freaking clowns that have ingrained their evil freaking laugh into my brain to this very day. They have other voice clips in the files, but it barely seems like they know any actual words. So you fight your way through this carnival, which is honestly just delightful. There are fairway games, that you can't play, carnival rides, that you can't ride. You can chase these little animals, and I swear one day I'll actually catch one and find out what they taste like. And then my favorite part, you get to go through this fun house filled with mirrors, and it ends in this spiral tube that leads to a slide. It's just such a fun level to explore, and I never feel lost, even in the hedge maze that's meant to make me confused and lost. I've always liked this part where you can make the clown kill the other clown, it's a nice little touch. Once you make it past the funhouse, you'll find a cannon that launches you into this arena, where the final showdown commences against this giant clown head that is probably responsible for my recurring childhood nightmare where my room becomes a liminal space and a giant Ronald McDonald head comes out of my wall and tries to swallow me whole, while I wrap myself in a mattress, burrito style. Yes. That's a real dream I constantly had for the first several years of my life.
The goal is to get rid of the clown head's three clown guards while it shoots at you, and then you have to hit the target when the head lifts up off the ground. Do that three times, and it's bye bye clowny. Hardy, har, har. Hardy, har, har. In Acrobaty Dash, you do a lot of platforming and swinging through a big top. And as I mentioned before, you'll need to grab the magic helper ball along the way to gain more time. This one's pretty straightforward. Parkour! <laughs> Next up is Cream Pie Flyer. This is a vehicle based level where you pilot a plane around the big top and shoot these clown cars with pies to release more clowns that you have to kill. This one gets a little frustrating because it's a smaller space than I would prefer, and it's really easy to bump into stuff and take damage. This is also a bit of a problem when hitting the cars because the hitboxes are finicky and I have to spam it over and over to get a clown to actually come out, and I usually end up ramming the car because I'm terrible at flying. This is random, but the health pickups aren't band-aids in this level and are instead these medkits. I believe they give you more health than a band-aid would, which I suppose makes sense, but it's still kind of weird, right? Why model an entirely separate health item? I guess they are easier to collect when flying the plane in this particular level, but these medkits only appear in a couple vehicle levels from what I can recall, and other vehicle levels just use the band-aids. I don't know, it's just odd to me. In the desert biome, all of the levels were clearly heavily inspired by Aladdin and the various Arabian Nights stereotypes. In Temple of the Lamp, you explore a village to collect a bunch of colorful gems to help quote, the nice genie, unquote, get back into his palace and retrieve his lamp. This one was definitely a favorite of mine growing up, because I loved collecting the gems. I thought they looked so cool and I found the noises when you picked them up incredibly satisfying. It's a little bit easy to find yourself lost or confused as to where to find more gems, but it doesn't bother me nearly as much as the jungle area because there's a clearer path to follow. The only enemies you'll find here are these giant beetles that can be found crawling around or popping out of breakable jars. All they do is race forward and kill themselves trying to kill you, but they are kind of hard to avoid, and as far as I can tell there's no way to inflict damage on them preemptively. Ultimately though, they're only a minor annoyance. In Meanie Genie, the nice genie's evil brother has escaped, and you have to make your way to his lamp to recapture him. This level starts out as kind of an on-rails shooter, where you ride a camel and use his spit to fight your way through an army of beetles, and then you move on to a platforming section where you avoid green smoke and ride a bunch of magic carpets throughout a cave system. This is one of my least favorites honestly. The shooting segment can be stressful, and the platforming is frustrating, and full of a lot of those little falls I was talking about. Rugrats Rug Race is about what it sounds like. You ride a magic carpet in another racing level. But the difference this time around is that the goal is to collect more of those pretty gems along the way before you reach the end. If you don't collect enough in time, it's game over. This is probably my favorite of the race levels, even if I fail more times than I succeed. I just love collecting those gems. The underwater section only consists of two levels this time. In both of them, you're operating a submarine. Hot Cod Racer isn't much to write home about, just another race, but now do it underwater, which most people hate in general, so... In Subadub Dub, you explore the ocean floor and use a magnet on the bottom of the sub to collect treasure chests and deliver them to nets strewn throughout the area. All in all, while I like Subadub Dub okay, the underwater stuff feels like the weakest in the whole game. Not necessarily bad like River Fun Run, just kinda bland, I guess. Let's take a second and assume that somewhere along the way, you ran out of coins and lost your last life. When this happens, a cutscene will play, where the babies gather around the bottom of the playset and talk about how they have to start all over, which Tommy says is going to give them diaper rash. Unfortunately, if you haven't been saving manually over and over throughout each challenge, you may lose some progress. I hated this as a kid. I sucked at video games if I'm being honest, and I would beg and plead out loud screaming, PLEASE NO DIAPY RASH, PLEASE NO DIAPY RASH, PLEASE NO DIAPY RASH, every time I failed and sent another baby down the slide of shame. Seeing that cutscene trigger felt like the equivalent of being shot, and dumb little child me constantly forgot to save. Actually, dumb little adult me still forgets to save. I'm too used to modern games where you don't have to worry about saving at all because the game does it for you. But yeah, that's just something to be wary of. 
make sure you're constantly collecting every coin, and also don't forget to check in on plant. It gets lonely. Now that we have enough big batteries, you know what time it is. Tier 3 Playset Transformation On this second to last floor of the Play Palace, you'll find three more themes. Space, Prehistoric, and Medieval. These contain some of the more fleshed out areas in my opinion, and require a lot more time and exploration to complete. If we take the Psycho Vacuum Tube up to space, we can jump into Cheesy Chase. In this delightful Lunar Cheese Factory adventure, you'll use the Psycho Vacuum technology to suck up the moon mice who are nibbling on all the moon cheese into your vacuum pack. Then when you have five stored away, you'll need to eject them into this giant vacuum chamber, never to be seen again. The Rugrats Hate Animals that is the moral of this children's video game. The vacuum chamber has a countdown of how many mice you'll need to complete the level, but if you get too close, it'll suck you up and shoot you at the top, which as we all know by now, will cause baby to fall down go boom. This one can be tricky, similar to hitting the monkeys with bananas. It's no simple task to catch up to these space mice, but once you finally catch one of them in your stream, it's so satisfying. I mean, just listen to that clunk sound. Mwah, perfection. Rise of the Angelians has you return to the Moon Factory to fight off a gooey alien horde. The goal now, though, is to collect parts for your ship to escape this nightmare. Angelians come in three different sizes. The normal sized ones will launch their exploding eyeballs at you in a bouncy arc. These gigantic ones will do the same, but much more violently, and they take multiple hits to kill. The tiny ones are kind of like the beetles in other levels that race after you and blow themselves up by hitting you. You can use your own bombs that you also throw in an arc to destroy the Angelians, but it can be tricky, especially with the tiny ones. I would say expect to take a lot of damage. You're mostly just exploring and completing platforming challenges while trying to avoid flying eyeballs in this one. It's simple and straightforward, but it can be frustrating, especially in instances like these where falling off the floating platform warps you all the way over here for some reason. Still, it's a very enjoyable level, and it's fun to go back through this low gravity space station. Moon Buggy Madness has you drive a dune buggy-like vehicle in a low gravity environment, collecting a bunch of cheese as you attempt to pull off tricks and jumps. The buggy is a little wonky to get a handle on at first, but once you figure it out, it's a ton of fun. Of course, there is one problem. In order to keep the moon-trotting adventure going, you have to collect fuel cells to keep your gas tank filled. That wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for the fact that there's only a handful of these things scattered around. Or at least, a handful of easily accessible ones. And the gas tank drains way too quickly. Luckily, there's so much cheese around, at least in easy and medium, that it's not that hard to quickly collect the amount you need. It's just a shame that you can't more freely explore and goof around without losing due to something so arbitrary. Moving right along to the prehistoric area, we start off with my favorite of the two levels here, Fly High Egg Hunt. This is definitely one of the more confusing and expansive sections of the game. And if you don't use that helper ball, you might screw yourself over a bit. However, this is also one of the most fun levels in the game, period. This level is basically a giant easter egg hunt, or a dino egg hunt I guess. You'll need to track down these seven brightly colored eggs, then take them back to their nest with the help of a few scary dactyls, dodging a bunch of obstacles like swinging bones and more beetle-like creatures along the way. When you get to the scary dactyls, you'll have to fly around and find another egg that matches the one you're carrying, which can be especially tricky when you're colorblind and a lot of eggs look the same to you. It's already a pretty difficult challenge with the magic helper ball guiding you, and without it, it might take you an hour or two. But personally, I love every second of it. Well, maybe not the part in the lava canyon. Rex riding is actually a somewhat similar concept as the last level, but instead of collecting eggs and flying pterodactyls, you're riding baby T-Rexes to collect bones and bring them to a pile. This one is not nearly as enjoyable though. It's a bit repetitive, and the area is a big wide plain that practically requires riding the dinos to get around at a reasonable pace, which means it's difficult to look for little batteries on foot, and controlling the dinos sucks. They are constantly moving forward, and the turning is way too wide, but what makes it extra frustrating is that if you bump into anything, or slightly trip over an incline, that's right, you guessed it, dino fall down, 
go boom. Then the dino disappears and you have to find another one, which is often easier said than done. And if they spot you trying to catch them, they will avoid you like the plague. On top of all this nonsense, getting the actual bones into the pile itself is impossible, since you're constantly running forward. You have to toss them at just the right angle from just the right distance, and you'll likely miss more times than you succeed. If I were you, I'd probably just skip this one, unless you need little batteries. Depending on how you look at it, the medieval world could be considered the second to last, or even the final area of the game since the final challenge is also medieval themed. In Bow and Apple, you're given a bow and arrow, or bow and plunger, and you have to explore this quaint little village to collect a certain number of apples. You can get apples by smashing barrels, sometimes at least, stupid coins. You can get the apples behind these locked gates if you hit the target that opens them, and you can get them by smashing these sentient suits of armor with your arrows. Also, can I just say, these stupid, terrifying monstrosities are the most threatening enemies in the entire game. The snowmen could barely hit you, the clowns were annoying but stupid, but these things, they were constantly hitting me perfectly with their magic laser. And lining up the shot to hit them, like many things in this game, is easier said than done. That's because this bow is super finicky to control. Once you pull it out, your movement becomes slow and you can't jump. Like when you're carrying a monkey or an egg. So, if you need to quickly dodge an attack, you have to put the bow away. Which would be fine if you didn't have to be standing completely still to put it away. And when you fire, you have to hold still and use the joystick to aim the shot the best you can. Which is also somewhat frustrating when trying to break floating barrels. By the time I've lined up my shot and can finally kill one of these suits of armor, I'll usually have lost at least half of my health bar. Thanks, game. Guess I'll go cook myself in this chimney. While there are quite a few annoyances with this level, I do still enjoy it, even if I can't catch the skunk. The Holy Pale takes you on a brand new quest through the village to find a magical artifact, a sand bucket with a hole in it. This level uses the magic helper ball as a part of the challenge itself, and you have to complete some tricky platforming to reach it and send it forward. You'll have to fight the suits of armor once again, but it's a lot easier this time around because you have three different power-ups you can use to assist you. The boots give you a couple seconds of being able to jump up really high and reach places you couldn't otherwise. The shield makes you invulnerable to the armor's magic laser for a minute or so, and the potion lets you throw your own magic energy blasts and kill the armor like the snowballs or snow cones. This one can take a while, and some of the jumps you'll need to make can take several tries, but it's a much better experience than bow and apple in my opinion. Once you reach the end, the helper ball will transform into the pail, and you can collect it like any other item. Now that the final big battery slot is complete, it's time for one last face-off against Queen Angelica to free her royal ransom. Let's storm this castle. While I'm not thrilled with the idea of the final level being vehicle based, I have to admit this is the best vehicle mission of the bunch, and one of my favorite levels in general. That's because this one is almost puzzle based. You're placed in a drivable catapult, and the goal is to find these pressure plates in the ground that will pull down an iron gate blocking the wooden doors behind them. Then you have to try to pull back and launch the catapult at just the right power level to hit the wooden door three times and break your way through. All of that sounds easy enough, but there are quite a few complications along the way. As you progress, each section has more layers of doors to break and therefore more pressure plates to find. A lot of these panels are hidden pretty well, and you'll have to use your catapult to break everything you can to find them. On top of that, you'll constantly be bombarded by other catapults from up high, which makes them difficult to destroy, more of those stupid freaking suits of armor that are the bane of my existence, and Angelica herself. Oh, she's terrifying. She will use her bubble wand to attack you with these nearly impossible to avoid bubbles. And it's so dang annoying. That's the main thing I hate about this level. You are constantly taking damage from one thing or another, and it usually feels unfair and out of your control. I ran out of band-aids many times while trying to finish this one in the present, and as a kid. After a few attempts though, I discovered a secret key behind a barred off window. It unlocked this tower in an earlier area that opened up to a spiral ramp and a fun little stunt course full of coins, and two medkits that fill up the entire health bar. 
After this discovery, completing the level in the game was a lot easier. There were still a couple of small frustrations, like lining up your vehicle just right on the pressure plates so that you don't fall off, or this final door that you had to hit from behind a windmill, but frankly, these mostly just felt like added challenge, like a mini golf course. Once you break through the final door, we finally get to kick Angelica off of the play palace. We see a cutscene where, this time, Angelica gets thrown down the slide of shame into the mud. The babies giggle at her and tell her she looks like a chocolate cake. Angelica says she's not a cake, she's a queen, but Tommy isn't having any of that. He tells her she isn't queen anymore, but now that they have fully expanded Stu's invention, they can all play on it together. Kimmy tells Angelica she should probably go back to the ocean section first though and take a bath. As our heroes wander off to play, Angelica mutters to herself that she needs to get new babies, because these ones are starting to get too smart for her. And that finally ends our Rugrats journey. So as you could probably tell, I do have a few gripes with this game. It can be frustrating at times, but I personally find that the highs of this platformer outweigh the lows. The variety in each challenge ensures you'll never be completely bored, similar to Creature from the Krusty Krab, and the fun you'll find in levels like Cone Caper, Cheesy Chase, and Temple of the Lamp will have you forgetting all about the struggles in River Fun Run, Rex Riding, and Monkey Business. The environments and themes were always captivating to me as a kid. Sure, the graphics are rudimentary, but exploring these colorful worlds kept me enjoying myself for hours. The music is pretty solid and feels very Rugrats. I wouldn't say it's a masterpiece of an arrangement, but it's usually pretty catchy. On the topic of audio, I do hate how all the characters, from Susie and Angelica to the babies, never shut up and repeat many of their lines over and over and over in a row. I appreciate the attention to detail that went into these little voice clips, but maybe they could have made them play less frequently and tried to ensure that the same line didn't play right after it already did. It's a relatively short adventure if you're just trying to make it to the main tower, especially on the easy difficulty, so I think you or your children will have a good time even through the little issues. I know I've done a lot of complaining, but I truly do enjoy most of the gameplay and I think Avalanche did a good job here, even if some of that rose tinting has faded for me over all these years. And at the end of the day, there's a plant you can push around. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Before we wrap up, there is one last aspect of this game we need to quickly cover. Up until now, I've failed to mention the other collectibles strewn throughout each world. These fat stacks of cash called Funny Money. You'll find it everywhere, but unlike the other pickups, they won't respawn when you enter a level. So you gotta make sure you do plenty of exploring if you want to get plenty of this currency. What is it for, you might ask? Well, the scary vacuum tube shop, of course! In this shop area, you can purchase a bunch of multiplayer minigames and other extras for the Play Silly Stuff option on the main menu. This gives you the opportunity to play with your friends in at least some small way. Some of them are a ton of fun, like Snow K Corral, where you are tossed into an arena and have to pelt each other in a good old-fashioned snowball fight, like Snow Place to Hide. In Double Subble Trouble, you face off in your submarines and try to hit each other with torpedoes. Loopy Hoop Race takes you back to the cockpit, and you race each other through colored rings to see who can fly through all of them the fastest. Double Scoop Cone Zone is by far my favorite, as it's the same basic idea as Snow K Corral, but you get to chase each other around a pretty substantial segment of the carnival, that even includes the hedge maze. Some of them aren't so fun, such as the return of my old nemesis, the Riverboat Race. It's the same terrible level, but this time, with friends! No, just, just no. There are also a few single player minigames that feel far less substantial. Examples include Carrot Catching, where you collect carrots on the sledding hill from Ready Set Snow, but the only thing you do here is collect as many of these carrots on the way down as you can. What is the point? It's the exact same thing as the normal level, but shorter, and the coins are replaced with orange vegetables. Another one is the same as Loopy Hoop Race, but you fly through the rings alone and see how many you can fly through before time runs out. Again, I'd rather play something else entirely? There are several more, both multiplayer and single player, good and bad, but I'd be here for way longer than I need to be discussing them all in detail. 
When you buy one of these mini-games, you'll then get the chance to buy bonus playable characters for each of them, like Angelica, Susie, or even Dill, Stu, and Grandpa in vehicle-based games. I didn't play these much as a kid, but they're a nice little addition, and can be a really fun distraction, especially when you had siblings who wanted to play with you growing up. They're no Mario Party, of course, but more play options are rarely a bad thing in comparison to not having anything extra at all. One thing is for sure, I'm going to play a lot more of Double Scoop Cone Zone with friends and family in the future. There seems to have been a handful of levels scrapped from the game early on in production. In the files, there's evidence of unused levels in the dinosaur area, the medieval area, and the underwater area. The underwater level even has an unused music track, which is what you are hearing now. Other than some file names in the data though, there isn't much else to go off of, so it's hard to say what these levels would have been like. I definitely believe they were real at some stage though, since all of these areas only have two levels each. It's likely that they were cut for a lack of time, as we know all too well by this point that Nickelodeon and THQ pushed some pretty strict deadlines to their developers. Of the few true critic reviews I can find, the opinions at the time of Royal Ransom's release were, rather expectantly, very mixed. Shane Satterfield, who at the time worked for the now defunct Tech TV and their show Extended Play, had this to say. Since children don't have the most discriminating taste when it comes to video games and complex games only serve to confuse them more than entertain them, it makes sense that THQ's game Rugrats Royal Ransom should walk the fine line between simplicity and inferiority. The story involves a revolutionary toy called the Play Palace 3000, a relatively small gadget that unfolds into a massive fortress with nine different levels. I might have to show them all in a The wicked Angelica kidnaps the kids' favorite toys and holds them hostage. So our hero set off to conquer the worlds inside the 3000 and foil Angelica's plan for playground domination. You can play as any of the Rugrats at any time you choose, but they all control exactly the same and have the same abilities. And that's not saying much because they do very little. While the invisible walls, handy magic helper ball, and simple environments make it easy for the young ones to keep going in the right direction, any simple failure means they'll have to start all over again from the beginning. This spells frustration for the kids the game is aimed at. Go! Many games primarily consist of piloting a variety of vehicles and simple races and work towards giving the game a much needed sense of variety. But the environments are overly simple, the camera controls are weak, and considering how few polygons are used to model each level plus the relative lack of special effects, the resulting game falls flat from a visual perspective. Perhaps a wise rental if your kids are fans of the original cartoon, but there's certainly more satisfying titles available. Extended play can only allow Rugrats Royal Ransom a two out of five. How come we can't ever have a nice quiet day full of nappies and milk? This review isn't one of the worst I have ever read, but I can't say I agree with many of his points or complaints. The thing I find the most disappointing here is the trend I so often have seen when making these videos, where reviewers tend to not give children enough credit or even insult their intelligence. Sure, as kids, we don't always notice the glaring flaws in something, but saying things like children are easily confused or acting like just because you got frustrated with something meant that kids couldn't handle it at all is just kind of ignorant to me. I got stuck in some places in this game as a kid for sure, but I always powered through and tried to persevere. And yeah, I beat this game back then, even on the hard difficulty. I've seen kids today beat even more difficult games all on their own. Kids are not stupid. Alan Appel of Nintendojo had a much more positive outlook to share. One tends to approach a game like Rugrats Royal Ransom with some trepidation. Oh, what can some kiddie title offer the hardcore gamer? How does solid control, inventive level design, and challenging gameplay sound, fanboy? The game is visually remarkable. As expected from a cartoon source, the colors are bright and vibrant, but little details abound. Characters leave footprints and kick up dust. Lighting effects are impressive, with shadows that cast and stretch realistically. Falling snowflakes add an interesting beauty to the winter stages. I suffered from vertigo in a circus level's Hall of Mirrors. The settings are varied from prehistoric and jungle landscapes to the ocean floor and caverns of the moon, all imaginatively portrayed. 
The character models are perfectly rendered 3D versions of their cartoon selves. Although I found the image of Tommy, the hydrocephalic, forceps-pinched, frog-lipped, chia-haired rugrat to be so creepy that I had to quit the game when I chose his character. Musically, the game is a standout. All too often, a child's game will feature short loops of simplistic musical nonsense, and you'll be forced to soon turn off the volume option. In contrast, some levels of Rugrat's Royal Ransom have downright hummable tracks. The controls are spot on. Utilizing only the control stick and, at most, three buttons, the controls are easy enough for any age to pick up and play. You can choose to play as any of the Rugrats, but no one character offers different skills, so pick a favorite. The camera displays a few quirks. It can get caught behind objects and isn't controllable in some situations, forcing you to make blind jumps, but it's not too unforgiving. A glitch caused my character to warp to another area within a level a couple of times. Rare, but worth mentioning. The Magic Helper Ball, a glowing orb which guides you through some levels, can move too fast and far to keep up with, and can be hard to relocate. It also stays where it was if you die, so memorization of level design is needed. This is one of the most surprisingly fun games I've played in some time. The sheer variety of the levels is outstanding. The Moon Buggy level is a worthy game on its own. You can fly a plane and pilot a submarine, perform circus acrobatics, ride a dinosaur, riverboat or sled. You'll find yourself replaying beaten levels just for kicks. Unlocking all the bonuses is well worth the effort. This is an excellent title for your child or younger sibling. And should one of your friends start talking smack, slap in this game and take him to school, Rugrat style. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate when an adult, especially from back then, is willing to see the good in games like these. But at the same time, I feel like maybe this guy was a little too positive? For example, I like the visuals, but let's be real, they aren't remarkable by any means. And I enjoy the soundtrack, but I wouldn't say it really stands out. I guess this guy just really had a good time playing this one. Nintendo Power themselves actually reviewed Royal Ransom as well, in their February 2003 issue. Tommy, Chucky, and the rest of the Rugrats gang attempt to dethrone Angelica, the queen of the Play Palace 3000, in a minigame-packed adventure. Activities include a river race against hungry crocodiles, a ride on a magic carpet, and plenty of obstacle courses in exotic locations. Each of the Play Palace's nine fantasy environments features three to four challenges. As you advance through the adventure, you'll unlock two-player games. Nintendo Power, 2003. The ratings here are certainly mixed, but I would say they leaned more towards the positive side. While some of the larger game review platforms such as IGN or GameSpot didn't bother to fully review this game, there were a couple of dedicated articles from these websites that were posted before and right after the release. There isn't really anything of substance in these small blurbs, but I did notice a couple of interesting bits while reading them for research on this video. For one, there's this bizarre line. THQ has released gameplay information pertaining to Rugrats Royal Ransom, an adventure game for the PS2 and GameCube. The somewhat confusing plot of the game revolves around Stu Pickles' latest invention, the Play Palace 3000, or PP3K. Justin Calvert, GameSpot, October 2002. Most of this article is a standard description of the game, and what to expect from it. The thing that baffles me is how he says the somewhat confusing plot of the game. I mean, in my opinion, Royal Ransom's plot is about as simplistic as it comes. How anyone, especially a games journalist, could find it confusing in any way is just beyond me. I suppose I could play devil's advocate and say maybe he didn't really watch the cartoon at all, and didn't understand how the babies were able to travel to fantastical worlds through a giant playset, but even then, I wouldn't call it confusing. He doesn't elaborate on this point later in the article either, so we can only continue to guess what he meant by somewhat confusing. They end off things by saying, the PS2 version of Rugrats Royal Ransom is scheduled for release on November 10th, while the GameCube version will follow on November 14th. We'll bring you more information on the game as it becomes available. They never posted anything else about this game from what I can tell. IGN had this to say in a seemingly promotional tone. We can breathe a sigh of relief now that THQ has shipped Rugrats Royal Ransom to PlayStation 2. And why not? Players get the chance to play as Tommy, Chucky, Kimmy, 
Phil, or Lil in an adventure to Stew Pickle's Play Palace 3000. You can fly on magic carpets, race snowmen, ride in a submarine, and pilot a moon buggy. Aside from taking on the role of a psychedelic sponge in SpongeBob SquarePants, what more can you possibly ask for? IGN 2002 If you've seen my previous SpongeBob videos, you can probably guess why I find that last line pretty freaking hilarious. For one, they made a big typo and wrote possible instead of what more could you possibly ask for. But the bigger offense to me would be how, while they implied here that they would rather play a Spongebob game, literally a day before this Rugrats article was posted, on November 25th, 2002, Mark Ryan Salee published his Revenge of the Flying Dutchman review that implied all Spongebob fans were autistic, and that you should buy your children Grand Theft Auto instead. It was pretty atrocious. I get that different people write different articles and have different opinions about things. Whoever wrote this Rugrats article, the author is only listed as IGN staff, might have genuinely liked this Rugrats game, and really wanted to play a Spongebob title as well. But I don't think they ever should have allowed that Spongebob review to be posted in the first place, especially when promoting both Nickelodeon IPs a day later. It's not really a matter of not liking Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. A negative opinion or review is entirely different from the abhorrent comments that writer made back then. Anyways, I've gotten sidetracked. As I mentioned before, Avalanche Software went on to be a pretty prolific developer for licensed children's games, creating the TAC series for Nickelodeon at the same time they were working on Rugrats. We developed a strong relationship with Nickelodeon through THQ, so when they asked us to pitch a game that could work as a TV show on Nickelodeon, we pitched them the Big Juju idea that we had. Big Juju went through about 9 months of presentations and was eventually selected by THQ and Nickelodeon as their first game TV property. It was renamed Tack and the Power of Juju. During this time, the company changed substantially. We grew to a studio of about 80 people from the original four. We had to learn how to be a good business, as well as better managers. Teams became large enough that management and communication became necessary skills. It was a big transition for us. Not all developers make it through. John Blackburn, 2011. While they worked on the third entry in the TAC series, The Great Juju Challenge, they also worked with Disney on a game for the then upcoming movie, Chicken Little. Apparently, Avalanche stood out to the House of Mouse, as they made the decision to purchase the developer for quote, less than 50 million dollars, unquote. At the time, Blackburn obviously painted the acquisition as nothing but positive. We kind of grew up a little bit from the time we started the company, until now. We all grew up and had kids and started making games for our kids that they could play. We've been doing a lot more family content lately. The plan is that not only is everybody going to stay, but we've got some growth plans for the future. Right now we've got three and a half game teams. We will fill that out to a fourth team, so about 150 people total over the next two years. Creatively, it's kind of cool because now we get to see up the skirt of Disney a little bit. It's allowing us a longer time frame to work on the games, and because we're a part of Disney, there'll be a high level of trust, so they can show us things and we can start on games earlier. John Blackburn, Desert News 2005 of course he would want to make it sound like they were all excited to be working exclusively for Disney at the time, but later down the line, he admitted that there were very mixed feelings behind the scenes. Though, he still believes, as many Avalanche employees likely did, that it was all for the best. We all thought working with Disney sounded cool. We were really impressed with all of the success their big animated films has had over the years. One of the cool things about making games for films is that you get direct access to the creative team on the film about 18 to 24 months before the film releases to the public. It is really interesting to watch some of the best creative minds in Hollywood grapple with hard problems and learn from and with them at the same time. We didn't understand it as well at the time, but working with them would make us better game makers. The feelings at the time of the acquisition were mixed. We were obviously excited by the new possibilities that working directly for Disney would offer, but we were also sad to give up working on the TAC franchise. TAC was finally being made into a TV series that year, so we didn't quite know what we were giving up. On the other hand, making games was becoming so expensive. We realized that the studios that were working on the bigger games were all becoming internal divisions of publishers. We wanted to keep working on large-scale projects, so we all believed it was the right choice. John Blackburn, 2011. Avalanche became one of, if not the most important game developer Disney had, creating games for Toy Story 3, one of my personal favorites, Cars 2, and then their most massively important project, 
Disney Infinity 1, 2, and 3. Disney Infinity, a Toys to Life game similar to Skylanders, was a pretty big deal at the time, and saw a lot of success. Unfortunately, Disney put all of their eggs in the Toys to Life market basket, and eventually, that market started to perform under expectations. Was it really that shocking though? Between the countless Skylanders entries, LEGO Dimensions, Amiibo, and three iterations of Disney Infinity itself, it all became an incredibly oversaturated fad. Personally, I like to compare it to the gaming crash Atari caused back in the day, with the crazy amount of bad games they put on their system. Perhaps Disney was already looking for a way out of the game development industry. Or maybe, they somewhat foolishly saw the failure of Disney Infinity as a failure of their gaming branch as a whole. Whatever the case, they sadly made the choice to shut down their gaming division altogether in 2016, and disband Avalanche Software in the process. For a short time, that seemed to be the end of it. The closure of another fantastic development studio that was ultimately out of that studio's control. That is, until early the next year, when Warner Brothers announced that they had acquired and reopened Avalanche, with Blackburn back at the helm, and that they were already working on, somewhat bizarrely, another Cars game for Disney. Ever since then, they've been put to work on the upcoming Harry Potter title, Hogwarts Legacy, that's set to be released later this year, if all goes according to their plans. Honestly, I think it's pretty incredible that Avalanche was able to come back from the dead like that, as it doesn't happen very often. Usually I'm ending these videos with some sad story about how a company ran out of money and had to shut down, never to be seen again. It's refreshing to see a happy ending of sorts. I don't know exactly where Avalanche Software goes from here, but we can probably bet their future is filled with Warner Brothers properties. Maybe they'll get to make a DC game or something along those lines. They certainly haven't always had the easiest time in the gaming industry, but they're still here making games. And ultimately, isn't that the biggest victory they could possibly have? I always tell people that our success was based on equal amounts of luck and hard work. We have had some pretty good breaks come our way, but we've always worked our tails off to make sure we took advantage of the opportunities. It has been at times discouraging and other times exhilarating. We have seen a lot of our sister studios in the valley come and go. And that can be scary at times. You definitely have the feeling sometimes of there but for the grace of God go I. Other times have been real high points that become almost surreal in a way. When you hear someone talking positively about one of your games when they don't know you worked on it or you hear a child say the tagline from one of your titles is really gratifying. That feeling keeps a lot of the team going here. We feed off the responses to the games, good and bad. Good responses make us feel great. Bad responses make us want to perform better. I personally love the feedback. In my opinion though, the best thing about working at Avalanche is the people I work with every day. I couldn't ask for a better group. I credit our longevity to the people who work here. They challenge and inspire each other to new creative solutions with every game we make. The people here care about the games and about our reputation as a studio. A lot of the people here make big sacrifices in their personal lives to make sure the games live up to the quality expectations of the players. That kind of dedication and passion is rare and it is a privilege to be part of. John Blackburn, 2011. I've played a ton of this team's many titles over the years, whether it was from Avalanche themselves or some of their earlier work on the SNES. And when I found out they were based out of Salt Lake when I lived in Ogden, I kind of nerded out a bit. It's neat when elements of your childhood line up like that. The one game of theirs that has always stood out to me the most though was Rugrats Royal Ransom, and it will likely continue to be my most beloved game they will ever make. It's not perfect by any means, but the memories I've made over the years in the Play Palace 3000 will always be some of the most cherished moments I will carry for the rest of my life, and hopefully, one day I'll get to share that with my own kids. Or, I guess, my own Rugrats. Thanks for watching guys, don't forget to subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.